Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is Songwriter 1984. This movie is a romping, stomping, Texas-sized comedy with a country music soundtrack that is hard to beat. It's also fun as heck. So let's jump right into the actors with only two show veterans. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Melinda Dillon played Honey Carter, the loving ex-wife of Doc Jenkins, Willie Nelson. Dylan was covered in episode 95, A Christmas Story, 1983. Rip Torn was about the best I have ever seen him as Dino McLeish, a small-time promoter. Torn was covered in episode 26, Time Limit, 1957. Well, this guy, even though he has about 50 credits, I'm not going to call him an actor. When he does have a role, he just plays himself, or sings, or both. And boy, can he sing, because he's Willie Nelson playing Doc Jenkins, who is pretty much Willie Nelson. Get the soundtrack if you can find it. Chris Christopherson plays singer Blackie Buck. It's important to really stretch yourself in the roles you take. Christopherson was born in Brownsville, Texas, the site of the First Battle of the Mexican-American War and the Last Battle of the Civil War. Christopherson was a Golden Glove boxer and attended college in California. He received a Rhodes Scholarship and studied at Oxford University. He later joined the Army and rose to the rank of captain before turning down a teaching gig at West Point. He left the Army to write songs. He got a job cleaning up in a record studio and flying a commercial helicopter. At the studio, he gave some songs to Johnny Cash, but nothing came of it. When Christopherson landed a helicopter in Cash's yard, his songs were taken a bit more seriously. Cash recorded Sunday Morning Coming Down, written by Christofferson, and it was a big hit. Christofferson lost his job as a pilot for drinking, and it ruined his marriage to singer Rita Coolidge. Christofferson's movie career began with the late movie 1971, which had an interesting premise and Julie Adams. The first movie I remember him in is Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, 1973, where he played Billy, and Bob Dylan was in the movie as well, providing songs. He played a biker in Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, 1974, but really got a lot of attention playing a singer on the way out because of booze. Hard to believe. Opposite, the oddly cast Barbara Streisand in A Star is Born, 1976. He also quit drinking that year. The same year, Christofferson was in The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea, 1976, which asked the filmatic question, Can Chris Christopherson act with his clothes on? Christopherson played a trucker in the horrible Convoy 1978 based on the fun song of the same name. Heaven's Gate 1980 virtually ruined his acting career, but he made a comeback with comedies such as Songwriter 1984 and Big Top Pee Wee 1988. He played a mean SOB in Fire Down Below 1997, battling with Steven Seagal, and another SOB in Payback 1999. He was terrible in the utterly horrible Planet of the Apes 2001, but did well in the Blade series 1998, 2002, and 2004. He was also in Dolphin Tale 2011 and Dolphin Tale 2 2014. Christofferson is still working at 80 and making movies. Leslie Ann Warren played the new singing star Gilda. Warren was born in 1946 in New York City. I'm walking here! She started training for stardom at an early age as a ballerina. Leslie studied at the New York Professional Children's School and moved to the actor's studio under Lee Strasberg by the time she was 17. Warren started working in theater and was on Broadway by 1963. Her top theater reviews led her to being selected to play Cinderella 1965 in a made-for-TV movie. She was amazing. I still remember when it came on. Warren was left with such a sweet image that she was signed by Disney and began playing the leads in movies like The Happiest Millionaire 1967 and the one and only genuine original family band 1968. Not really happy with this squeaky clean image, Warren left Disney for a time and went by Leslie Warren. 
She replaced Barbara Bain on Mission Impossible 1970 for one year. Bain left the show just two episodes after her husband, Martin Landau, left over a contract dispute. Horn began working in many TV movies, which were all the rage at the time. She even starred in Portrait of a Stripper, 1979, as her career appeared to be winding down. But when she played Norma Cassidy in the musical Victor Victoria, 1982, alongside James Garner, she was back in the catbird seat. This led to a few odd roles such as Songwriter, 1984, before she transitioned into the sexy older woman for films like A Night in Heaven, 1983. She played Miss Scarlet in the riotously funny Clue 1985. She also started working more in television. This great actress is still working. Richard C. Serafian played the role of Rodeo Rocky. Serafian was a part-time actor, but he seemed to be much better as a director. Serafian was born in 1930 in New York City. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! He served in the military during the Korean conflict. Following the war, Serafian attended New York University. Serafian eventually moved to Kansas City, where he was working as a reporter. He met director Robert Altman, who gave him a job. Serafian also married Altman's sister. I'm not sure of the sequence. Serafian's roles include Songwriter 1984, Bugsy 1991, and Bullworth 1998. Among his 62 directing credits are Man in the Wilderness 1971, which is an earlier version of The Revenant 2015 with John Huston and Richard Harris. Vanishing Point 1971, which is a great counterculture car movie that was the inspiration for Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof 2017. Lolly Madonna XXX 1973. The Man Who Loved Cat Dancing 1973. Great title. The Next Man 1976 with Sean Connery. The Bear 1984. About Bear Bryant. Roll Tide. Eye of the Tiger 1986, which featured Gary Busey against a violent motorcycle gang. Street Justice 1987, which was about the same as the previous. And Solar Crisis 1990 with an Alan Smithy. Serafian died in 2013. What is an Alan Smithy? An Alan Smithy was the best kept secret in Hollywood for a while. When a film director cannot accept a film that they made, because of conflicts with actors or the producer, or for any other reason, and they feel that they lost creative control, they could apply to the Directors Guild of America, DGA, and the film director credit would be given to Alan or Alan Smithy. This process started in 1968 and officially ended in 2000. The rules state that the director would not talk about the circumstances that caused the problem. The movie that got all this started was Death of a Gunfighter, 1969, which starred Richard Widmark, whom I feel was a pretty mean guy. Widmark got director Robert Totten removed and replaced with Don Siegel. Although each director spent a different number of days directing, the final cut had almost equal footage for both men. Siegel stated that it was really Widmark directing when each man was in charge. Neither man wanted to take credit for the film, and thus the smithy was created by the DGA. Other films that wear this crown include the Birds 2 Lands in 1994. The Shrimp on the Barbie 1990. Let's Get Harry 1986. And Twilight Zone the Movie 1983 for second assistant director. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The movie begins with a younger Doc Jenkins, Willie Nelson, Blackie Buck, Chris Christopherson, and Honey Carter, Melinda Dillon, singing behind chicken wire as beer bottles are thrown at the band. As the tour continues, Doc and Honey are married. Money for music comes into Doc's hands and out of his hands for some scheme like selling bull semen. Just bought yourself some real bull. When's the last time you bought any bull semen, pal? It's a hundred thousand dollar bull, right? As it continues, Honey starts having children and leaves the band. The two guys go on singing. Doc keeps spending all his money on schemes until the marriage breaks up. Doc gets married again and divorced again. Finally, Doc decides that someone is making money on the songwriting, and he quits the road to be a mogul, leaving only Blackie on the road. Doc partners with Rodeo Rocky, Richard C. Serafian. Doc is looking for a female singer to produce. 
Doc is trying to record music, but he is beset upon by one of his ex-wives for back support. Doc gets the word that Rodeo Rocky really owns the company and that he doesn't have any real money. Rodeo Rocky just put the clamp on the Cowbird music money. How can he do that? I'm the president of the company. <laughs> you sold him the company. Oh, bullshit. He just come in as an investor. That's not what the contract says. You sell something to somebody, they own it. You work for him. At Rodeo Rocky's office, they tell Doc that he hasn't been living up to his contract and the money has been cut off. I want to talk to you. Yeah, well, go ahead, Chris. Get this asshole out of here. He stays. Who is he? Purvis, Lionel Purvis. He's the new comptroller for Cowbird Music. Well, you're just a prick I want to talk to. How come my checks are bouncing? Because you haven't been living up to your contract. Who said? I do. All Doc has is the building and Blackie's contract. On Blackie's tour bus, they find out that Dino McLeish, Rip Torn, has been selling tickets to Blackie Buck concerts without booking the band. They turn the bus around and head to Austin where Dino is selling fake tickets. Dino goes to his home and his pretty young wife is there with a baby. Dino puts a pistol in his boot and his wife demands to be taken to the concert. She asks who the opening act will be. Driving towards Austin is Gilda, Leslie Ann Warren, a nervous singer and her bandmate Arlie. Michael Raphael. Dino has to carry her onto the stage. Paid money to hear you. They came here oh, to see Blackie Book, you know it. Yeah, but they gonna remember you, not him. When she starts singing, she can wail. However, she is drinking like a fish. Dino announces that Blackie is not coming and encourages the fans to tear the place up. About this time, Blackie and his crew show up. Blackie hits Dino up for $5,000 for the show, and then he sees how good a singer Gilda is. After the show, Blackie and the band have to use bats and shotguns to get their money. Blackie says he only drinks so people won't say that he's a drug fiend. Take another 500 out of there for Dino calling me an alcoholic son of a bitch. The only reason I drink is so people won't think I'm a dope fiend. Later, Blackie and the band go to Honey's house and are very welcome. Blackie puts Honey on the phone with Doc. Blackie tells Doc about Gilda. Gilda is playing at a hotel when Dino, his wife, Doc, and Blackie go to watch. They like what they see. Dino has Gilda under contract, so he and Doc have to work out a deal. They go to Gilda's house, and Doc flirts and gets Gilda wanting to work with him. Doc plays a song, Songwriter, for the partiers. Doc and Dino continue to work on Gilda and getting her to record. Dino mentions that he found Gilda at the Pentecostal Center. Doc buys a vacuum cleaner and shows up at Honey's house. Finally, she's happy to see him. Doc says he's been off the booze for a year. Then Honey chews him out for wasting money. Doc plays Honey a song and she remembers the good times. The kids come in and Doc works on music with his family. Doc flies back to Nashville where he's a mogul at Cowbird Records. He steals all the songs he has written. Doc calls his assistant to take all of his stuff to Austin. He confirms that he owns the building before burning it down. Rocky finds out the building has burned. Doc heads to Austin singing and playing the entire way. Doc opens Lone Star Records in Austin. Doc gets the message that Rocky is going to break his knees and he's looking for a place to hide his songs. Blackie is sleeping with Dino's wife. What the hell is Lone Star Music? I'll tell you when you get here. You're playing hell with my schedule. Blackie, I need you. Blackie? Where you going? Blackie? You good looking son of a bitch, don't you never die. Doc arranges with Gilda to take credit for writing his song so Rocky can't claim it. I can't take money for something I didn't write. I don't think you should. Actually, you should take the credit and I'll take the royalties. I can't put my name on your song. The strange part of it is I can't either. Why? It's a business technicality. Oh. Rocky and his gang show up in Austin and search Doc's office. Rocky says he has owed six albums and seven years of songwriting. This ain't old Rodeo Rocky. This is Marvin Ruff Shirt from the streets of Chicago. And I don't let no hick like you knock down when I fight my whole life to build up. Blackie and his bunch bust in with shotguns, and Doc says, Blackie is the president of Lone Star Records. Doc takes Blackie to a house he has rented, then he pitches his deal about Gilda. Blackie will play some local shows and then go on the road with Gilda. Gilda is nervous and drinks a lot. 
Doc has Gilda's tape delivered to Blackie. Gilda has taken the writing credits for the songs, and Blackie says he will do the same thing if it will screw Rocky. I need to talk to you. What about? Well, I'll listen to that tape of Gilda's new song. Oh, yeah? What do you think? I think she's a shitty songwriter. Oh, yeah? We do need to talk. Why are you asking Gilda to put her name on your song? Because I can't put my name on it. Rodeo Rocky would get all the money. Why didn't you ask me? Because you're a songwriter. That's the answer. Well, that girl's never written anything in her life. It's okay for people like that who can't write to say they wrote something they didn't write. They do that all the time. But you're a songwriter, and you can't say you wrote something that you didn't write unless you really wrote it. Say that again. I can't. You're getting real strange, Doc. I put my name on one of your songs and it screw Rodeo Rocky, providing you got another one. It's as good as the one you gave Gilda. Say that again? I can't. Doc takes Gilda's song to the radio and uses payola to get it played. Rocky is getting angry about Gilda, and he pushes hard to get Doc shut down. He finally realizes it is Doc's song. Doc heads out on the road with Blackie and Gilda. Everything is great, but she keeps on drinking. The pressure of success is too much for her. Doc's wife is on the bus, and she is getting closer to one of the band members. Dino explains how sheep flirt with people and sometimes start relationships. I was only 13 years old, but I cried no, all night. No. Over a sheep? What'd he say? About a damn sheep. Listen, nine times out of ten, you know, they think people start this, but uh, sheep is good, and they know it. They'll flirt with you, don't think they won't. Hey, Dino, your old lady says you ain't half bad. <laughs> Just remember some bitch. The older the ram, the stiffer the horn. When they get to the hotel, Sam is missing. Dino finds him in bed with his wife. Dino brings Sam out in his whitey tidies and makes him stand by the pool with a beer on his head. Dino takes a breath and drops the gun to his side, raises it quickly and shoots the beer off Sam's head. Doc says, I underestimated you, Dino, to which Dino replies, all you some bitches do. Now, Dino, she told me that y'all had a plutonic relationship. Take it right here. It wasn't exactly entirely all my fault, goddammit. Stop right there. Better than me and some asshole. Take a swig. Put that right on top of your head. Fixing to kill old Sam? Try to see whether my nerves are under control. I'm afraid you stepped in it this time, boy. Doc, can you talk to him, the crazy son of a bitch? I expect this will be a good lesson for you. <sighs> I underestimated you, Dino. Oh, you son of a bitch, you stupid. By this point in the tour, Gilda is almost catatonic. Rocky gets the injunction he has been waiting for so he can claim more of Doc's songs that come out under other people's names. Gilda is now headlining the tour and adding pills to her booze. Gilda makes it to number one. Dino tells Doc he's glad they went with Gilda, adding that we put all our chips on a hysterical, neurotic, drunk woman and she's going to make us rich or dead. Gilda shows up at Doc's room with a bottle and a bucket of ice. Gilda puts a hard press on Doc, but he doesn't fall for it. Honey calls, and Doc uses the call to get rid of Gilda. When Gilda leaves, we find out that Blackie was on the phone instead. Later, they get a call that Gilda overdosed. Gilda went to Honey's house to confess and passed out. Honey revived her in a cold tub. Doc shuts down the party at his house, and in the morning... He goes to tell Honey that he is ready to settle down. Gilda and Arlie come in and announce that they have gotten married. She also raises her hand, gospel style. Rocky serves the injunction and Doc offers to sell Gilda for $2 million. Gilda's getting so big, I just can't handle it all. Besides, you deserve all that anyway. For how much? $2 million cash. It was the ground cold this morning, Doc. I mean, you want blood. Find somebody else's neck, not mine. Doc wants to keep his Blackie contract and his songwriting contract. They settle on $1 million for just Gilda's contract. Dino goes backstage and hits one of Rocky's guys with a brick. Gilda shows up looking pretty happy and sober. She meets Rocky and impresses him. Hey, Gilda, this is Rodeo Rocky. This is Gilda. Hey, Arlie, how are you? Doing? I've heard a lot about you. But you seem to be a nice man anyhow. Well, I am a nice man anyhow. Doc gets the million and Gilda goes on stage. When the lights come on, 
Gilda announces that she is born again and will only sing gospel from now on. Rocky passes out. Dino robs the money cage and takes half of everything. I'll make a collection of Rodeo Rocky. Here's my authorization. Right here. Just give me half. Come on now. Keep going. Come on. Get on the floor. Get on the floor. How much did we get? I did pretty good. You got robbed. There's a lot of that going on. How many tickets did you sell? 7,200. Building holds five. Well, shit, Bubba. Airlines do that all the time. Doc drops off a tape with a song he says he wrote for Rocky. They play the tape for Rocky and its songwriter. Rocky is happy. Blackie takes up with the secretary, and Doc goes back to his family. World famous short summary. He did it for the love, but he wasn't above the money. I hope you enjoyed today's show. You can find connections to social media and email on my site at snarkymoviereviews.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All that I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware of the moors.